At one of these moments of stillness, it suddenly occurred to my perception what nothing but this slight contact could have assured me in the darkness that I was in a powerful current, and that this current set the wrong way. Instantly, a flood of new intelligence came. Either I had unconsciously turned and was rapidly nearing the rebel shore, a suspicion which a glance at the stars corrected, or else it was the tide itself which had turned, and which was sweeping me down the river with all its force, and was also sucking away at every moment the narrowing water from that treacherous expanse of mud out of whose horrible miry embrace I had lately helped to rescue a shipwrecked crew. Either alternative was rather formidable. I can distinctly remember that for about one half minute the whole vast universe appeared to swim in the same watery uncertainty in which I floated. I began to doubt everything, to distrust the stars, the line of low bushes for which I was wearily striving, the very land on which they grew, if such visionary things could be rooted anywhere. Doubts trembled in my mind like the weltering water, and that awful sensation of having one's feet unsupported, which benumbs the spent swimmer's heart, seemed to clutch at mine, though not yet to enter it. I was more absorbed in that singular sensation of nightmare, such as one may feel equally when lost by land or by water, as if one's own position were all right, but the place looked for had somehow been preternaturally abolished out of the universe. At best, might not a man in the water lose all his power of direction, and so move in an endless circle until he sank exhausted. It required a deliberate and conscious effort to keep my brain quite cool. I have not the reputation of being of an excitable temperament, but the contrary. Yet I could at that moment see my way to a condition in which one might become insane in an instant. It was as if a fissure opened somewhere and I saw my way into a madhouse. Then it closed, and everything went on as before. Once in my life I had obtained a slight glimpse of the same sensation. And then too, strangely enough, while swimming, in the mightiest ocean surge into which I had ever dared to plunge my mortal body. Keats hints at the same sudden emotion in a wild poem written among the Scottish mountains. It was not the distinctive sensation which drowning men are said to have, that spasmodic passing in review of one's whole personal history. I had no well-defined anxiety, felt no fear, was moved to no prayer, did not give a thought to home or friends. Only it swept over me, as with a sudden tempest, that, if I meant to get back to my own camp, I must keep my wits about me. I must not dwell on any other alternative, any more than a boy who climbs a precipice must look down. Imagination had no business here. That way, madness lay. There was a shore somewhere before me, and I must get to it by the ordinary means, before the ebb laid bare the flats, or swept me below the lower bends of the stream. That was all. Suddenly, a light gleamed for an instant before me as if from a house in a grove of great trees upon a bank, and I knew that it came from the window of a ruined plantation building, where our most advanced outposts had their headquarters. The flash revealed to me every point of the situation. I saw at once where I was and how I got there, that the tide had turned while I was swimming, and with a much briefer interval of slack water than I had been led to suppose that I had been swept a good way downstream and was far beyond all possibility of regaining the point I had left. Could I, however, retain my strength to swim one or two hundred yards farther, of which I had no doubt, and if the water did not ebb too rapidly, of which I had more fear, then I was quite safe. Every stroke took me more and more out of the power of the current, and there might even be an eddy to aid me. I could not afford to be carried down much farther, for there the channel made a sweep toward the wrong side of the river, but there was now no reason why I should not reach land. I could dismiss all fear, indeed, except that of being fired upon by our own sentinels, many of whom were then new recruits, 
and with the usual disposition to shoot first and investigate afterwards. I found myself swimming in shallower and shallower water, and the flat seemed almost bare when I neared the shore, where the great gnarled branches of the live oaks hung far over the muddy bank. Floating on my back for noiselessness, I paddled rapidly in with my hands, expecting momentarily to hear the challenge of the picket and the ominous click so likely to follow. I knew that someone should be pacing to and fro along that beat, but could not tell at what point he might be at that precise moment. Besides, there was a faint possibility that some chatty corporal might have carried the news of my bath thus far along the line, and they might be partially prepared for this unexpected visitor. Suddenly, like another flash, came the quick, quaint challenge. Halt! Who goes there? F f friend with the countersign, retorted I, with chilly but conciliatory energy, rising at full length out of the shallow water, to show myself a man and a brother. Advance, friend, and give the countersign, responded the literal soldier, who at such a time would have accosted a spirit of light or goblin damned with no other formula. I advanced and gave it, he recognizing my voice at once. And then and there, as I stood, a dripping ghost, beneath the trees before him, the unconscionable fellow wishing to exhaust upon me the utmost resources of military hospitality, deliberately presented arms. Now, a soldier on picket, or at night, usually presents arms to nobody, but a sentinel on camp guard by day is expected to perform that ceremony to anything in human shape that has two rows of buttons. Here was a human shape, but so utterly buttonless that it exhibited not even a rag to which a button could by any earthly possibility be appended, buttonless even potentially. And my blameless Ethiopian presented arms to even this. Where, then, are the theories of Carlyle, the axioms of Sartor Resartus, the inability of humanity to conceive a naked Duke of Windlestraw, addressing a naked House of Lords. Cautioning my adherent, however, as to the proprieties suitable for such occasions thenceforward, I left him watching the river with renewed vigilance and awaiting the next merman who should report himself. Finding my way to the building, I hunted up a sergeant and a blanket, got a fire kindled in the dismantled chimney, and sat before it in my single garment, like a moist but undismayed Choctaw until horse and clothing could be brought round from the Kausi Way. It seemed strange that the morning had not yet downed, after the uncounted periods that must have elapsed. But when the wardrobe arrived, I looked at my watch and found that my night in the water had lasted precisely one hour. Galloping home, I turned in with alacrity and without a drop of whiskey, and waked a few hours after in excellent condition. The rapid changes of which that department has seen so many, and perhaps to so little purpose, soon transferred us to a different scene. I have been on other scouts since then, and by various processes, but never with a zest so novel as was afforded by that night's experience. The thing soon got wind in the regiment, and led to only one ill consequence, so far as I know. It rather suppressed a way I had of lecturing the officers on the importance of reducing their personal baggage to a minimum. They got a trick of congratulating me very respectfully on the thoroughness with which I had once conformed my practice to my precepts. Next chapter, Up the Adisto. In reading military history, one finds the main interest to lie undoubtedly in the great campaigns where a man, a regiment, a brigade, is but a pawn in the game. But there is a charm also in the more free and adventurous life of partisan warfare, where, if the total sphere be humbler, yet the individual has more relative importance, and the sense of action is more personal and keen. This is the reason given by the eccentric revolutionary biographer Weems for writing the life of Washington first, and then that of Marion. And there were, certainly, in the early adventures of the colored troops in the Department of the South, some of the same elements of picturesqueness that belonged to Marion's band on the same soil. 
with the added feature that the blacks were fighting for their personal liberties, of which Marion had helped to deprive them. It is stated by Major General Gilmore in his Siege of Charleston, as one of the three points in his preliminary strategy, that an expedition was sent up the Edisto River to destroy a bridge on the Charleston and Savannah Railway. As one of the early raids of the colored troops, this expedition may deserve narration, though it was, in a strategic point of view, a disappointment. It has already been told, briefly, and on the whole, with truth, by Greeley and others, but I will venture on a more complete account. The project dated back earlier than General Gilmore's siege and had originally no connection with that movement. It had been formed by Captain Trowbridge and myself in camp and was based on facts learned from the men, General Saxton and Colonel W. W. H. Davis, the successive post commanders, had both favored it. It had also been approved by General Hunter before his sudden removal, though he regarded the bridge as a secondary affair because there was another railway communication between the two cities. But as my main object was to obtain permission to go, I tried to make the most of all results which might follow, while it was very clear that the raid would harass and confuse the enemy and be the means of bringing away many of the slaves. General Hunter had, therefore, accepted the project mainly as a stroke for freedom and black recruits. And General Gilmore, because anything that looked toward action found favor in his eyes, and because it would be convenient to him at that time to effect a diversion, if nothing more. It must be remembered that, after the first capture of Port Royal, the outlying plantations along the whole southern coast were abandoned, and the slaves withdrawn into the interior. It was necessary to ascend some river for 30 miles in order to reach the black population at all. This ascent could only be made by night, as it was a slow process, and the smoke of a steamboat could be seen for a great distance. The streams were usually shallow, winding and muddy, and the difficulties of navigation were such as to require a full moon and a flood tide. It was really no easy matter to bring everything to bear especially as every projected raid must be kept a secret so far as possible. However, we were now somewhat familiar with such undertakings, half military, half naval, and the thing to be done on the Adisto was precisely what we had proved to be practicable, on the St. Mary's and the St. John's, to drop anchor before the enemy's door some morning at daybreak, without his having dreamed of our approach. Since a raid made by Colonel Montgomery, up the Combahee, two months before, the vigilance of the rebels had increased. But we had information that upon the South Edisto, or Pon Pon River, the rice plantations were still being actively worked by a large number of Negroes, in reliance on obstructions placed at the mouth of that narrow stream, where it joins the main river some twenty miles from the coast. This point was known to be further protected by a battery of unknown strength at Willtown Bluff, a commanding and defensible situation. The obstructions consisted of a row of strong wooden piles across the river, but we convinced ourselves that these must now be much decayed, and that Captain Trowbridge, an excellent engineer officer, could remove them by the proper apparatus. Our proposition was to man the John Adams, an armed ferry boat, which had before done us much service, and which has now reverted to the pursuits of peace, it is said, on the East Boston line, to ascend in this to Willtown Bluff, silence the battery, and clear a passage through the obstructions. Leaving the John Adams to protect this point, we could then ascend the smaller stream with two light draft boats and perhaps burn the bridge, which was ten miles higher before the enemy could bring sufficient force to make our position at Willtown Bluff untenable. The expedition was organized essentially upon this plan. The smaller boats were the Enoch Dean, a river steamboat which carried a ten-pound parrot gun and a small howitzer, and a little mosquito of a tug, the Governor Milton, upon which, with the greatest difficulty, we found room for two 12-pound Armstrong guns, 
with their gunners, forming a section of the 1st Connecticut Battery, under Lieutenant Clinton, aided by a squad from my own regiment, under Captain James. The John Adams carried, if I remember rightly, two Parrot guns, of 20 and 10 pounds caliber, and a howitzer or two. The whole force of men did not exceed 250. We left Beaufort, S. by C., on the afternoon of July 9, 1863. In former narrations, I have sufficiently described the charm of a moonlight ascent into a hostile country, upon an unknown stream, the dark and silent banks, the rippling water, the wail of the reed birds, the anxious watch, the breathless listening, the veiled lights, the whispered orders. To this was now to be added the vexation of an insufficient pillotage, for our Negro guide knew only the upper river, and, as it finally proved, not even that. While, to take us over the bar which obstructed the main stream, we must borrow a pilot from Captain Dutch, whose gunboat blockaded that point. This active naval officer, however, whose boat expeditions had penetrated all the lower branches of those rivers, could supply our want, and we borrowed from him not only a pilot, but a surgeon, to replace our own, who had been prevented by an accident from coming with us. Thus accompanied, we steamed over the bar in safety, had a peaceful ascent, passed the island of Jehosi, the fine estate of Governor Aiken, then left undisturbed by both sides, and fired our first shell into the camp at Willtown Bluff at four o'clock in the morning. The battery, whether fixed or movable we knew not, met us with a promptness that proved very short-lived. After three shots it was silent, but we could not tell why. The bluff was wooded, and we could see but little. The only course was to land, under cover of the guns. As the firing ceased and the smoke cleared away, I looked across the rice fields which lay beneath the bluff. The first sunbeams glowed upon their emerald levels, and on the blossoming hedges along the rectangular dikes. What were those black dots which everywhere appeared? Those moist meadows had become alive with human heads, and along each narrow path came a straggling file of men and women, all on a run for the riverside. I went ashore with a boatload of troops at once. The landing was difficult and marshy. The astonished Negroes tugged us up the bank and gazed on us as if we had been Cortez and Columbus. They kept arriving by land much faster than we could come by water. Every moment increased the crowd, the jostling, the mutual clinging, on that miry foothold. What a scene it was! With the wild faces, eager figures, strange garments, it seemed, as one of the poor things reverently suggested, like Naughton but to Judgment Day. Presently, they began to come from the houses also, with their little bundles on their heads, then with larger bundles. Old women trotting on the narrow paths would kneel to pray a little prayer, still balancing the bundle, and then would suddenly spring up, urged by the accumulating procession behind, and would move on till irresistibly compelled by thankfulness to dip down for another invocation. Reaching us, every human being must grasp our hands amid exclamations of, Bress you, Masser, and bress de Lord, at the rate of four of the latter ascriptions to one of the former. Women brought children on their shoulders. Small black boys carried on their backs little brothers equally inky and, gravely depositing them, shook hands. Never had I seen human beings so clad, or rather so unclad, in such amazing squalidness and destitution of garments. I recall one small urchin without a rag of clothing save the basque waist of a lady's dress, bristling with whalebones and worn wrong side before, beneath which his smooth ebony legs emerged like those of an ostrich from its plumage. How weak is imagination, how cold is memory, that I ever cease, for a day of my life, to see before me the picture of that astounding scene. Yet at the time we were perforce a little impatient of all this piety, protestation, and hand-pressing. 
for the vital thing was to ascertain what force had been stationed at the bluff and whether it was yet withdrawn. The slaves, on the other hand, were too much absorbed in their prospective freedom to aid us in taking any further steps to secure it. Captain Trowbridge, who had by this time landed at a different point, got quite into despair over the seeming deafness of the people to all questions. How many soldiers are there on the bluff? he asked of the first comer. Mazer, said the man, stuttering terribly. I c c c c Tell me how many soldiers there are, roared Trowbridge in his mighty voice, and all but shaking the poor old thing in his thirst for information. O oh, Maser, recommenced in terror the incapacitated witness, I c c carpenter holding up eagerly a little stump of a hatchet, his sole treasure, as if his profession ought to excuse him from all military opinions. I wish that it were possible to present all this scene from the point of view of the slaves themselves. It can be most nearly done, perhaps, by quoting the description given of a similar scene on the Combahee River by a very aged man who had been brought down on the previous raid, already mentioned, I wrote it down in tent, long after, while the old man recited the tale with much gesticulation at the door. And it is by far the best glimpse I have ever had, through a negro's eyes, at these wonderful birthdays of freedom. De people was all a hoin masser, said the old man. Day was a hoin in the rice field when de gunboats come. Den ebri man drap dem ho, and left de rice. The masser he stand and call, run to the wood for hide, Yankee come, sell you to Cuba, run for hide. Every man he run, and, my God, run all toter, way. Masser stand in the wood, peep peep, fade for truce, afraid to trust. He say, run to the wood, and every man run by him, straight to the boat. De brack soldier so presumptuous, they come right ashore, hold up their head. Fust ting I know, dere was a barn, ten toos and bushel rough rice, all in a blaze, den Maser's great house, all cracklin' up the roof. Did net I care for see em blaze? Lor, Maser didn't care not in at all, I was gawine to the boat. Doors Don Quixote could not surpass the sublime absorption in which the gaunt old man, with arm uplifted, described this stage of affairs, till he ended in a shrewd chuckle, worthy of Sancho Panza. Then he resumed, De Brack sire so presumptuous. This he repeated three times, slowly shaking his head in an ecstasy of admiration. It flashed upon me that the apparition of a black soldier must amaze those still in bondage, much as a butterfly just from the chrysalis might astound his fellow grubs. I inwardly vowed that my soldiers, at least, should be as presumptuous as I could make them. Then he went on. Oly woman and I go down to de boat. Den they say behind us, rebels comin', rebels comin'. Old woman say, come ahead, come plenty ahead. I have not e none but my shirt and pantaloon. Old woman one single frock he have on, and one handkerchief on he head. I left all to my blanket and run for de rebel come, and den they didn't come, didn't trust for come. He's eighty-eight-year-old, Mezer. My old Mezer loans keep all the ages in a big book, and when we come to age up since we mark em down every year. So I know. Too old for come. Mezer joking. Neighbor too old for leave the land of bondage. I old but great good for chillin. Give two and tank every day. Young people can go through. Force forcibly, Messier. But de old folk must go slow. Such emotions as these, no doubt, were inspired by our arrival, but we could only hear their hasty utterance in passing, our duty being, with the small force already landed, to take possession of the bluff. Ascending, with proper precautions, the wooded hill, we soon found ourselves in the deserted camp of a light battery, amid scattered equipments and suggestions of a very unattractive breakfast. As soon as possible, Skirmishers were thrown out through the woods to the farther edge of the bluff, while a party searched the houses, finding the usual large supply of furniture and pictures brought up for safety from below, but no soldiers. 
Captain Trowbridge then got the John Adams beside the row of piles and went to work for their removal. Again, I had the exciting sensation of being within the hostile lines, the eager explorations, the doubts, the watchfulness, the listening for every sound of coming hooves. Presently, a horse's tread was heard in earnest, but it was a squad of our own men bringing in two captured cavalry soldiers. One of these, a sturdy fellow, submitted quietly to his lot, only begging that, whenever we should evacuate the bluff, a note should be left behind stating that he was a prisoner. The other, a very young man and a member of the rebel troop, a sort of cadet corps among the Charleston youths, came to me in great wrath, complaining that the corporal of our squad had kicked him after he had surrendered. His air of offended pride was very rueful, and it did indeed seem a pathetic reversal of fortunes for the two races. To be sure, the youth was a scion of one of the foremost families of South Carolina, and when I considered the wrongs which the black race had encountered from those of his blood, first and last, it seemed as if the most scrupulous recording angel might tolerate one final kick to square the account. But I reproved the corporal, who respectfully disclaimed the charge, and said the kick was an incident of the scuffle. It certainly was not their habit to show such poor malice. They thought too well of themselves. His demeanor seemed less lofty, but rather piteous, when he implored me not to put him on board any vessel which was to ascend the upper stream, and hinted, by awful implications, the danger of such ascent. This meant torpedoes, a peril which we treated, in those days, with rather mistaken contempt. But we found none on the Edisto and it may be that it was only a foolish attempt to alarm us. Meanwhile, Trowbridge was toiling away at the row of piles, which proved easier to draw out than to saw asunder, either work being hard enough. It took far longer than we had hoped, and we saw noon approach and the tide rapidly fall, taking with it, inch by inch, our hopes of effecting a surprise at the bridge. During this time, and indeed all day, the detachments on shore under Captains Whitney and Sampson, were having occasional skirmishes with the enemy, while the colored people were swarming to the shore or running to and fro like ants with the poor treasures of their houses. Our busy quartermaster, Mr. Bingham, who died afterwards from the overwork of that sultry day, was transporting the refugees on board the steamer or hunting up bales of cotton or directing the burning of rice houses in accordance with our orders. No dwelling houses were destroyed or plundered by our men, Sherman's bummers not having yet arrived, though I asked no questions as to what the plantation Negroes might bring in their great bundles. One piece of property, I must admit, seemed a lawful capture, a United States dress sword of the old pattern, which had belonged to the rebel general, who afterwards gave the order to bury Colonel Shaw with his niggers. That, I have retained, not without some satisfaction, to this day. A passage having been cleared at last, and the tide having turned by noon, we lost no time in attempting the ascent, leaving the bluff to be held by the John Adams and by the small force on shore. We were scarcely above the obstructions, however, when the little tug went aground, and the Enoch Dean, ascending a mile farther, had an encounter with a battery on the right, perhaps our old enemy and drove it back. Soon after, she also ran aground, a misfortune of which our opponent strangely took no advantage, and on getting off, I thought it best to drop down to the bluff again, as the tide was still hopelessly low. None can tell, save those who have tried them, the vexations of those muddy southern streams navigable only during a few hours of flood tide. After waiting an hour, the two small vessels again tried the ascent. The enemy on the right had disappeared, but we could now see, far off on our left, another light battery moving parallel with the river, apparently to meet us at some upper bend. But for the present, we were safe, with the low rice fields on each side of us, and the scene was so peaceful, it seemed as if all danger were done. For the first time, we saw in South Carolina blossoming river banks and low emerald meadows that seemed like New England. Everywhere there were the same rectangular fields, 
smooth canals, and bushy dikes. A few Negroes stole out to us in dugouts and breathlessly told us how others had been hurried away by the overseers. We glided safely on, mile after mile. The day was unutterably hot, but all else seemed propitious. The men had their combustibles all ready to fire the bridge, and our hopes were unbounded. But by degrees, the channel grew more tortuous and difficult, and while the little Milton glided smoothly over everything, the Enoch Dean, my own boat, repeatedly grounded. On every occasion of a special need, too, something went wrong in her machinery, her engine being constructed on some wholly new patent, of which, I should hope, this trial would prove entirely sufficient. The black pilot, who was not a soldier, grew more and more bewildered, and declared that it was the channel, not his brain, which had gone wrong. The captain, a little elderly man, sat wringing his hands in the pilot box, and the engineer appeared to be mingling his groans with those of the deceased engine. Meanwhile I, in equal ignorance of machinery and channel, had to give orders only justified by minute acquaintance with both. So I navigated on general principles until they grounded us on a mud bank just below a wooded point and some two miles from the bridge of our destination. It was with a pang that I waved to Major Strong, who was on the other side of the channel in a tug, not to risk approaching us, but to steam on and finish the work if he could. Short was his triumph. Gliding round the point, he found himself instantly engaged with a light battery of four or six guns, doubtless the same we had seen in the distance. The Milton was within 250 yards. The Connecticut men fought their guns well, aided by the blacks, and it was exasperating for us to hear the shots, while we could see nothing and do nothing. The scanty ammunition of our bow gun was exhausted, and the gun in the stern was useless, from the position in which we lay. In vain, we moved the men from side to side, rocking the vessel to dislodge it. The heat was terrific that August afternoon. I remember I found myself constantly changing places on the scorched deck to keep my feet from being blistered. At last, the officer in charge of the gun, a hardy lumberman from Maine, got the stern of the vessel so far round that he obtained the range of the battery through the cabin windows. But it would be necessary, he coolly added, on reporting to me this fact, to shoot away the corner of the cabin. I knew that this apartment was newly painted and gilded, and the idol of the poor captain's heart. But it was plain that even the thought of his own upholstery could not make the poor soul more wretched than he was. So I bade Captain Dolly blaze away, and thus we took our hand in the little game, though at a sacrifice. It was of no use. Down drifted our little consort round the point, her engine disabled and her engineer killed, as we afterwards found, though then we could only look and wonder. Still pluckily firing, she floated by upon the tide, which had now just turned, and when, with a last desperate effort, we got off, our engine had one of its impracticable fits, and we could only follow her. The day was waning, and all its range of possibility had lain within the limits of that one tide. All our previous expeditions had been so successful, it now seemed hard to turn back. The riverbanks and rice fields, so beautiful before, seemed only a vexation now. But the swift current bore us on, and after our Parthian shots had died away, a new discharge of artillery opened upon us from our first antagonist of the morning, which still kept the other side of the stream. It had taken up a strong position on another bluff, almost out of range of the John Adams, but within easy range of us. The sharpest contest of the day was before us. Happily, the engine and engineer were now behaving well, and we were steering in a channel already traversed, and of which the dangerous points were known. But we had a long, straight reach of river before us, heading directly toward the battery, which, 
having once got our range, had only to keep it, while we could do nothing in return. The rebels certainly served their guns well. For the first time I discovered that there were certain compensating advantages in a slightly built craft as compared with one more substantial. The missiles never lodged in the vessel, but crashed through some thin partition as if it were paper to explode beyond us or fall harmless in the water. Splintering, the chief source of wounds and death in wooden ships, was thus entirely avoided. The danger was that our machinery might be disabled or that shots might strike below the waterline and sink us. This, however, did not happen. Fifteen projectiles, as we afterwards computed, passed through the vessel or cut the rising. Yet few casualties occurred, and those instantly fatal. As my orderly stood leaning on a comrade's shoulder, the head of the ladder was shot off. At last, I myself felt a sudden blow in the side, as if from some prize fighter, doubling me up for a moment, while I sank upon a seat. It proved afterwards to have been produced by the grazing of a ball, which, without tearing a garment, had yet made a large part of my side black and blue, leaving a sensation of paralysis which made it difficult to stand. Supporting myself on Captain Rogers, I tried to comprehend what had happened, and I remember being impressed by an odd feeling that I had now got my share, and should henceforth be a great deal safer than any of the rest. I am told that this often follows one's first experience of a wound. But this immediate contest, sharp as it was, proved brief. A turn in the river enabled us to use our stern gun, and we soon glided into the comparative shelter of Willtown Bluff. There, however, we were to encounter the danger of shipwreck, superadded to that of fight. When the passage through the piles was first cleared, it had been marked by stakes, lest the rising tide should cover the remaining piles and make it difficult to run the passage. But when we again reached it, the stakes had somehow been knocked away. The piles were just covered by the swift current, and the little tugboat was aground upon them. She came off easily, however, with our aid, and when we in turn essayed the passage, we grounded also, but more firmly. We getting off at last and making the passage, the tug again became lodged when nearly past danger, and all our efforts proved powerless to pull her through. I therefore dropped down below and sent the John Adams to her aid, while I superintended the final recall of the pickets, and the embarkation of the remaining refugees. While thus engaged, I felt little solicitude about the boats above. It was certain that the John Adams could safely go close to the piles on the lower side, that she was very strong, and that the other was very light. Still, it was natural to cast some anxious glances up the river, and it was with surprise that I presently saw a canoe descending, which contained Major Strong. Coming on board, he told me with some excitement that the tug could not possibly be got off, and he wished for orders. It was no time to consider whether it was not his place to have given orders, instead of going half a mile to seek them. I was by this time so far exhausted that everything seemed to pass by me as by one in a dream. But I got into a boat, pushed upstream, met presently the John Adams returning, and was informed by the officer in charge of the Connecticut battery that he had abandoned the tug and, worse news yet, that his guns had been thrown overboard. It seemed to me then, and has always seemed, that this sacrifice was utterly needless, because although the captain of the John Adams had refused to risk his vessel by going near enough to receive the guns, he should have been compelled to do so. Though the thing was done without my knowledge and beyond my reach, yet, as commander of the expedition, I was technically responsible. It was hard to blame a lieutenant when his senior had shrunk from a decision and left him alone, nor was it easy to blame Major Strong, whom I knew to be a man of personal courage, though without much decision of character. He was subsequently tried by court-martial and acquitted, after which he resigned and was lost at sea 
on his way home. The tug, being thus abandoned, must of course be burned to prevent her falling into the enemy's hands. Major Strong went with prompt fearlessness to do this, at my order, after which he remained on the Enoch Dean, and I went on board the John Adams, being compelled to succumb at last and transfer all remaining responsibility to Captain Trowbridge. Exhausted as I was, I could still observe, in a vague way, the scene around me. Every available corner of the boat seemed like some vast auction room of second-hand goods. Great piles of bedding and bundles lay on every side, with black heads emerging and black forms reclining in every stage of squalidness. Some seemed ill or wounded, or asleep, others were chattering eagerly among themselves, singing, praying, or soliloquizing on joys to come. Breast de Lord, I heard one woman say, I speck I get salt victual now, notin' but fresh victual these six months, but ease get salt victual now. Thus reversing, under pressure of the salt embargo, the usual anticipations of voyagers. Trowbridge told me, long after, that, on seeking a fan for my benefit, he could find but one on board. That was in the hands of a fat old auntie, who had just embarked, and sat on an enormous bundle of her goods in everybody's way, fanning herself vehemently, and ejaculating as her gasping breath would permit, Oh, do, Jesus! Oh, do, Jesus! When the captain abruptly disarmed her of the fan and left her continuing her pious exercises, Thus we glided down the river in the waning light. Once more we encountered a battery, making five in all. I could hear the guns of the assailants and could not distinguish the explosion of their shells from the answering throb of our own guns. The kind quartermaster kept bringing me news of what occurred, like Rebecca in Front de Boeuf's castle, but discreetly withholding any actual casualties. Then all faded into safety and sleep and we reached Beaufort in the morning, after thirty-six hours of absence. A kind friend, who acted in South Carolina a nobler part amid tragedies than in any of her early stage triumphs, met us with an ambulance at the wharf, and the prisoners, the wounded and the dead, were duly attended. The reader will not care for any personal record of convalescence, though, among the general military laudations of whiskey, it is worthwhile to say that one life was saved, in the opinion of my surgeons, by an habitual abstinence from it, leaving no food for peritoneal inflammation to feed upon. The able-bodied men who had joined us were sent to aid General Gilmore in the trenches, while their families were established in huts and tents on St. Helena Island. A year after, greatly to the delight of the regiment, in taking possession of a battery which they had helped to capture on James Island, they found in their hands the self-same guns which they had seen thrown overboard from the Governor Milton. They then felt that their account with the enemy was squared and could proceed to further operations. Before the war, how great a thing seemed the rescue of even one man from slavery, and since the war has emancipated all, how little seems the liberation of two hundred. But no one then knew how the contest might end, and when I think of that morning sunlight, those emerald fields, those thronging numbers, the old women with their prayers, and the little boys with their living burdens, I know that the day was worth all it cost and more. Next Chapter The Baby of the Regiment we were in our winter camp on Port Royal Island. It was a lovely November morning, soft and spring-like. The mockingbirds were singing, and the cotton fields still white with fleecy pods. Morning drill was over. The men were cleaning their guns and singing very happily. The officers were in their tents, reading still more happily their letters just arrived from home. Suddenly, I heard a knock at my tent door and the latch clicked. It was the only latch in camp, and I was very proud of it, and the officers always clicked it as loudly as possible in order to gratify my feelings. The door opened, and the quartermaster thrust in the most beaming face I ever saw. Colonel, said he, there are great news for the regiment. My wife and baby are coming by the next steamer. Baby, 
said I in amazement. Q.M., you are beside yourself. We always called the quartermaster Q.M. for shortness. There was a pass sent to your wife, but nothing was ever said about a baby. Baby, indeed. But the baby was included in the pass, replied the triumphant father of a family. You don't suppose my wife would come down here without her baby. Besides, the pass itself permits her to bring necessary baggage and is not a baby six months old, necessary baggage. But, my dear fellow, said I, rather anxiously, how can you make the little thing comfortable in a tent amidst these rigors of a South Carolina winter when it is uncomfortably hot for drill at noon and ice forms by your bedside at night? Trust me for that, said the delighted Papa, and went off whistling. I could hear him telling the same news to three others, at least, before he got to his own tent. That day the preparations began, and soon his abode was a wonder of comfort. There were posts and rafters, and a raised floor, and a great chimney, and a door with hinges, every luxury except a latch, and that he could not have, for mine was the last that could be purchased. One of the regimental carpenters was employed to make a cradle, and another to make a bedstead high enough for the cradle to go under. Then there must be a bit of red carpet beside the bedstead, and thus the progress of splendor went on. The wife of one of the colored sergeants was engaged to act as nursery maid. She was a very respectable young woman, the only objection to her being that she smoked a pipe. But we thought that perhaps baby might not dislike tobacco, and if she did, she would have excellent opportunities to break the pipe in pieces. In due time, the steamer arrived, and baby and her mother were among the passengers. The little recruit was soon settled in her new cradle and slept in it as if she had never known any other. The sergeant's wife soon had her on exhibition through the neighborhood, and from that time forward she was quite a queen among us. She had sweet blue eyes and pretty brown hair, with round, dimpled cheeks, and that perfect dignity which is so beautiful in a baby. She hardly ever cried, and was not at all timid. She would go to anybody, and yet did not encourage any romping from any but the most intimate friends. She always wore a warm, long-sleeved scarlet cloak with a hood, and in this costume was carried, or toted, as the soldiers said, all about the camp. At guard mounting in the morning, when the men who are to go on guard duty for the day are drawn up to be inspected, Baby was always there to help inspect them. She did not say much, but she eyed them very closely and seemed fully to appreciate their bright buttons. Then the officer of the day, who appears at guard mounting with his sword and sash and comes afterwards to the colonel's tent for orders, would come and speak to Baby on his way and receive her orders first. When the time came for drill, she was usually present to watch the troops, and when the drum beat for dinner, she liked to see the long row of men in each company march up to the cookhouse in single file, each with tin cup and plate. During the day, in pleasant weather, she might be seen in her nurse's arms about the company streets, the center of an admiring circle, her scarlet costume looking very pretty amidst the shining black cheeks and neat blue uniforms of the soldiers. At dress parade, just before sunset, she was always an attendant. As I stood before the regiment, I could see the little spot of red out of the corner of my eye at one end of the long line of men, and I looked with so much interest for her small person that instead of saying at the proper time, attention battalion, shoulder arms, it is a wonder that I did not say, shoulder babies. Our little lady was very impartial and distributed her kind looks to everybody. She had not the slightest prejudice against color and did not care in the least whether her particular friends were black or white. Her especial favorites, I think, were the drummer boys, who were not my favorites by any means, for they were a roguish set of scamps and gave more trouble than all the grown men in the regiment. 
I think Annie liked them because they were small and made a noise and had red caps like her hood and red facings on their jackets, and also because they occasionally stood on their heads for her amusement. After dress parade, the whole drum corps would march to the great flagstaff and wait till just sunset time when they would beat the retreat, and then the flag would be hauled down. A great festival for Annie. Sometimes the sergeant major would wrap her in the great folds of the flag after it was taken down, and she would peep out very prettily from amidst the stars and stripes like a newborn goddess of liberty. About once a month, some inspecting officer was sent to the camp by the general in command to see to the condition of everything in the regiment, from bayonets to buttons. It was usually a long and tiresome process, and, when everything else was done, I used to tell the officer that I had one thing more for him to inspect, which was peculiar to our regiment. Then I would send for baby to be exhibited, and I never saw an inspecting officer, old or young, who did not look pleased at the sudden appearance of the little, fresh, smiling creature, a flower in the midst of war. And Annie, in her turn, would look at them with the true baby dignity in her face, that deep, earnest look which babies often have, and which people think so wonderful when Raphael paints it, although they might often see just the same expression in the faces of their own darlings at home. Meanwhile, Annie seemed to like the camp style of housekeeping very much. Her father's tent was double, and he used the front apartment for his office and the inner room for parlor and bedroom while the nurse had a separate tent and washroom behind all. I remember that the first time I went there in the evening, it was to borrow some writing paper, and while baby's mother was hunting for it in the front tent, I heard a great cooing and murmuring in the inner room. I asked if Annie was still awake, and her mother told me to go in and see. Pushing aside the canvas door, I entered. No sign of anybody was to be seen, but a variety of soft little happy noises seemed to come from some unseen corner. Mrs. C. came quietly in, pulled away the counterpane of her own bed, and drew out the rough cradle where lay the little damsel, perfectly happy and wider awake than anything but a baby possibly can be. She looked as if the seclusion of a dozen family bedsteads would not be enough to discourage her spirits, and I saw that camp life was likely to suit her very well. A tent can be kept very warm, for it is merely a house with a thinner wall than usual, and I do not think that Baby felt the cold much more than if she had been at home that winter. The great trouble is that a tent chimney, not being built very high, is apt to smoke when the wind is in a certain direction, and when that happens it is hardly possible to stay inside. So we used to build the chimneys of some tents on the east side, and those of others on the west, and thus some of the tents were always comfortable. I have seen baby's mother running in a hard rain with little red riding hood in her arms to take refuge with the adjutant's wife when every other abode was full of smoke, and I must admit that there were one or two windy days that season when nobody could really keep warm, and Annie had to remain ignominiously in her cradle with as many clothes on as possible for almost the whole time. The quartermaster's tent was very attractive to us in the evening. I remember that once, on passing near it after nightfall, I heard our major's fine voice singing Methodist hymns within, and Mrs. C.'s sweet tones chiming in. So I peeped through the outer door. The fire was burning very pleasantly in the inner tent, and the scrap of new red carpet made the floor look quite magnificent. The Major sat on a box, our surgeon on a stool, Q.M., and his wife, and the adjutant's wife, and one of the captains, were all sitting on the bed, singing as well as they knew how, and the baby was under the bed. Baby had retired for the night, was overshadowed, suppressed, sat upon. The singing went on, and she had wandered away into her own land of dreams nearer to heaven, perhaps, than any pitch their voices could attain. I went in and joined the party. Presently the music stopped, and another officer was sent for to sing some particular song. At this pause, the invisible innocent waked a little 
and began to cluck and coo. It's the kitten, exclaimed somebody. It's my baby, exclaimed Mrs. C. triumphantly, in that tone of unfailing personal pride which belongs to young mothers. The people all got up from the bed for a moment while Annie was pulled from beneath, wide awake and placid as usual, and she sat in one lap or another during the rest of the concert, sometimes winking at the candle, but usually listening to the songs with a calm and critical expression, as if she could make as much noise as any of them whenever she saw fit to try. Not a sound did she make, however, except one little soft sneeze, which led to an immediate flood tide of red shawl covering every part of her but the forehead. But I soon hinted that the concert had better be ended, because I knew from observation that the small damsel had carefully watched a regimental inspection and a brigade drill on that day, and that an interval of repose was certainly necessary. Annie did not long remain the only baby in camp. One day, on going out to the stables to look at a horse, I heard a sound of baby talk addressed by some man to a child nearby, and, looking round the corner of a tent, I saw that one of the hostlers had something black and round lying on the sloping side of a tent with which he was playing very eagerly. It proved to be his baby, a plump, shiny thing, younger than Annie and I never saw a merrier picture than the happy father frolicking with his child while the mother stood quietly by. This was baby number two, and she stayed in camp several weeks, the two innocents meeting each other every day, in the placid indifference that belonged to their years. Both were happy little healthy things, and it never seemed to cross their minds that there was any difference in their complexions. As I said before, Annie was not troubled by any prejudice in regard to color, nor do I suppose that the other little maiden was. Annie enjoyed the tent life very much, but when we were sent out on picket soon after, she enjoyed it still more. Our headquarters were at a deserted plantation house, with one large parlor, a dining room, and a few bedrooms. Baby's father and mother had a room upstairs with a stove whose pipe went straight out at the window. This was quite comfortable, though half the windows were broken, and there was no glass and no glazier to mend them. The windows of the large parlor were in much the same condition, though we had an immense fireplace, where we had a bright fire whenever it was cold and always in the evening. The walls of this room were very dirty and it took our ladies several days to cover all the unsightly places with wreaths and hangings of evergreen. In this performance, Baby took an active part. Her duties consisted of sitting in a great nest of evergreen, pulling and fingering the fragrant leaves, and occasionally giving a little cry of glee when she had accomplished some piece of decided mischief. There was less entertainment to be found in the camp itself at this time, but the household at headquarters was larger than Baby had been accustomed to. We had a great deal of company, moreover, and she had quite a gay life of it. She usually made her appearance in the large parlor soon after breakfast, and to dance her for a few moments in our arms was one of the first daily duties of each one. Then the morning reports began to arrive from the different outposts, a mounted officer or courier coming in from each place, dismounting at the door, and clattering in with jingling arms and spurs, each a new excitement for Annie. She usually got some attention from any officer who came, receiving with her wonted dignity any daring caress. When the messengers had ceased to be interesting, there were always the horses to look at, held or tethered under the trees beside the sunny piazza. After the various couriers had been received, other messengers would be dispatched to the town seven miles away, and Baby had all the excitement of their mounting and departure. Her father was often one of the riders, and would sometimes seize Annie for a goodbye kiss, place her on the saddle before him, gallop her round the house once or twice, and then give her back to her nurse's arms again. She was perfectly fearless and such boisterous attentions never frightened her, nor did they ever interfere with her sweet, infantine self-possession.